Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, at IBM. Uh, they like to call us cognitive software engineers whenever we work on their, their Watson or their deep learning stuff. So I'm a software engineer at IBM. Uh, and today I'll be going over uh, kind of a, an overview of distributed deep learning uh, and, and then kind of drill down into some specific areas and uh, hopefully give you an idea of uh, how distributed deep learning works and, and kind of the, the things you have to think about when you're, when you're distributing uh, your deep learning project. Uh, yeah, so the idea is we'll, we'll start with a, a survey of, of distributed deep learning in general, uh, kind of go into the different, different ways that you can distribute deep learning uh, and give an overview of each of those, uh, but then really drill down into uh, data parallel uh, distributed deep learning, which is the, uh, the most common, uh, most commonly used method for distributing deep learning uh, right now, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, yeah, and it's what you see used most often. And we'll kind of end with an example, uh, going through an example, and also looking at uh, some specific technical considerations uh, that you have to take into account uh, so basically gotchas that, that you usually run into when you're first distributing uh, some deep learning project. All right. Uh, so the idea of distributed deep learning, as most of you probably know, uh, but just to put it into words, uh, deep neural networks really came into relevancy uh, with the, the rise of compute power that we mostly saw from using GPUs for compute. Uh, that gave us enough computational power to actually work on these, these neural networks uh, in reasonable amounts of time. Uh, but as soon as we could, uh, people started throwing more data at them. They started making them deeper, uh, bigger, and, and driving up the, the com computational need uh, to train these neural networks. Uh, and with only now you know, four to eight, you know, six GPUs in a box, uh, it really became necessary to distribute uh, that training very quickly. Uh, and we're going to look at how to do that. Uh, and you can see, uh, I, th this, this graph is pretty interesting. This is a, they, they took a, a survey of uh, papers being published in uh, deep learning and, and kind of mapped out uh, if the papers focused on using GPUs uh, or CPUs or FPGAs. Uh, in this graph on the left, and you can see that that green bar in the middle, that's GPUs, and as we go from you know, 2010 to now, you see that green bar getting bigger and bigger. So you see the move towards GPUs, and then the graph on the right there, uh, the green bar here is distributed, so multi-node training, blue node, uh, single node training, and again, you can see that move towards, that trend towards uh, distributed training. Uh, so it's a, it's a definite trend that's happening. All right, so the uh, methods of distribution that we're going to look at today are uh, hyperparameter uh, search parallelisms, uh, model parallelisms, and data parallelisms. And again, we're going to end on the, or we're going to focus on that data parallelism at the end. So uh, hyperparameter search parallelisms, uh, also uh, architecture search parallelisms. Uh, the idea is you, uh, so with hyperparameter search parallelisms, you have, a, you have a model and you want to find the optimal hyperparameters to use on that model to train it uh, most efficiently, so to, to get the highest training accuracy. Uh, so the idea is you duplicate this model across as many nodes as you want, you, you know, give, it, give everyone a different set of hyperparameters, you train them, you pick the one that got the best results, and that's the one you go with. Uh, and then you can iterate. Uh, maybe you do some kind of evolutionary algorithm. Uh, you take that, that best result, you, you know, randomize it some more, and, and keep iterating. Uh, on the other hand, the architecture search uh, is similar, but in this case, you're actually searching for the, the optimal uh, network model, so the optimal network architecture. So instead of just varying your your hyperparameters across the machines, you're actually using different models with the same input data testing the accuracy. Uh, so now instead of the data science, scientists making the, the model by hand, you're, you're, you're going out and searching for it. Uh, and there's a lot of research into the best way to search for these values, you know, how, how do you sample your, 
your parameters. You know, you, you don't want to oversample your unimportant parameters or undersample your very important parameters. Uh, so a lot of research goes into that. Uh, and you can see this is a, an obviously uh, embarrassingly parallel uh, application. And so it was the, the first big uh, method of distributing this deep learning. Uh, and, and it's still used today. Uh, there's, there's still, uh, at IBM, we have the, the hyperparameter tuning and Watson Machine Learning Accelerator. And there's a, a new tool out of research called, they call it new nets. Uh, other uh, people are doing something similar. Uh, but with new nets, you have this uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary algorithm that goes out and builds neural networks for you. Uh, and they're seeing pretty good results. Uh, another method of distribution is uh, model parallelisms, uh, specifically in this case network parallelisms. So uh, with model distribution, you actually take and divide your layers across the nodes so that uh, uh, each layer in your neural network, uh, parts of it are being computed on different nodes. Uh, so you, you have the benefit of, you know, you're spreading your memory across all the devices, so you're, you're saving yourself, you're distributing your memory as well as your computation. Uh, but it does have a high cost of communication, so an overhead of communication. Uh, in your, especially with fully connected layers, uh, you're, you're basically, all, you, all of your neural network nodes need to communicate with each other. Uh, so, so it does have a, a high communication cost. Uh, and, uh, and probably for that, for that reason, it's, it's not used that much nowadays. It's still used, uh, but, uh, but yeah, not, not as much, I think, as it, as it used to be. There are many cases, though, where your, your model is big enough that you still need to distribute the memory. So it, it does end up used in some cases. Uh, another form of model distribution uh, is something called layer pipelining. Uh, so in this case, instead of separating the actual uh, layers themselves across the nodes, uh, you put, you know, individual layers on separate nodes. Uh, and the, you know, your computation, so your computation will flow from node to node to node. Uh, and the idea is you, you set up this pipeline in such a way, uh, you know, that it, that it works efficiently. Uh, so there ends up being a lot of tuning uh, to, to get the, your, your data and your computation to flow through uh, your pi pipeline just right. Uh, but, uh, you know, cuts down on your communication cost overall. Uh, and you can see uh, Google's uh, working on something they call G-Pipe. Uh, that's, that's a form of this uh, layer pipelining. And finally, uh, another form is data parallelisms, so data distribution. Uh, the idea behind uh, the data parallel distribution is that you actually have complete copies of the model on each uh, learner, so in, in most cases, GPU. So you have a, a complete copy of the model on each GPU. Uh, you divide your training batch between all of those models, and you feed a portion of the batch through each model. Each model goes through the full forward pass, full backward pass, and then you, when you're updating your weights on each model, you average your gradients. So you're averaging the work done on all the machines. Uh, it works. It works for most layer, uh, most of your neural network layers, things like activations, convolutions, fully connected, and your pooling layers. Uh, we'll see towards the end. Uh, there's at least one uh, type of layer that that it doesn't work very well for, so you have to keep an eye out. All right. And we're gonna again uh, dive deeper into this uh, data parallel uh, distributed deep learning. So specifically what I'll be talking about is uh, asynchronous, meaning uh, that each learner is at the same stage in, in training as opposed to asynchronous where they can, you know, they kind of uh, go out and do their own thing and sync back up at certain points. Uh, all to all, meaning that there's no server, so every node communicates with every other node. Uh, there's no parameter server or anything like that. And then uh, data parallel distributed GPU deep learning. Uh, so in, in this case, a process is created for each GPU in the cluster. Uh, so on Summit, uh, 
you have six GPUs in the box, you get, you get six processes uh, on each box. Uh, so the, the, a learner in this sense is actually a specific GPU, not a specific node. Uh, so in that case, there is a, a complete copy of the model for each process, so a complete copy of the model for each GPU on the, on the machine. You divide the mini batch, so you divide your, your current training batch across all of the processes, uh, guaranteeing that each process gets different input data. It's important that every process gets a different piece of the data. If they all get the same data, they're all doing the same thing. And then after each uh, pass through the network, all of the, process, all the processes average their gradients, uh, usually using you know, an all reduce, uh, and those averages you use those average, average gradients to update your local weights. Uh, so the idea is, whenever you, after you average your gradients, you use those average gradients to update your weights, the model on every GPU should remain identical throughout the training process. All right, uh, next we'll look at some uh, different tools used in uh, specifically uh, data parallel distributed deep learning, but they're used in in most uh, distributed deep learning projects. Uh, mostly to kind of illustrate what they are, uh, a lot of times people combine a couple of these tools together, uh, kind of thinking they do what they don't do. Uh, so just to, to make it clear what these different tools are. Uh, so first we have our communication libraries. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, a couple of these. Uh, the idea with the communication libraries is they provide the actual functions that do the communicating. It's kind of in the name. Uh, so primarily, they, they, you know, they have things like all reduce and broadcast functions. Uh, so the first one on the list here is MPI. Uh, it's your classic distributed computing tool. Uh, it's still used a lot uh, in deep learning. Uh, second on the list here is Nickel. That's uh, NVIDIA's GPU to GPU uh, direct communication library. Uh, it is not only within the box anymore. Uh, so since Nickel 2, uh, it also supports internode communication. Uh, and then we also have IBM's PowerAI DDL. Uh, the main thing it gives you is, is this topology where I'll reduce. Uh, and it basically uses MPI Nickel underneath uh, for its communication, but uses them at different times. Uh, but so important note, these are just communication libraries. Uh, without any kind of uh, framework or tooling, you know, you'd have to call into to C code or, or Python wrappers directly. Uh, the next thing we're gonna look at are the integrations into these frameworks uh, that basically gives you access to these communication libraries. Uh, the first one on the list is TensorFlow's distribution strategies. That's their new uh, method for natively uh, facilitating distributed deep learning. Uh, you know, previously they had some not so good stuff. The uh, distribution strategies uh, are getting a lot better. Uh, you also have Horvod. It's, uh, it is itself not a communication library. It is just an integration into other frameworks or into frameworks, uh, things like PyTorch and TensorFlow, uh, that give you access to these communication libraries, MPI and Nickel. Uh, they also do a lot of work in optimizing those communications, things like trying to schedule the communication at the same time as computations. Uh, yep, and then uh, IBM PowerEye DDL also offers TensorFlow operators, uh, PyTorch integrations, uh, things like that. All right, uh, and now I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on what we do at IBM, the PowerEye DDL, uh, present it some, and then get into an example uh, using it. So, uh, PowerAI DDL, uh, as I've said a couple times, it's, uh, it prov it, it's mainly a communication library providing you know, an optimized all reduce. Uh, all reduce being the, you know, the main uh, cornerstone for uh, distributed deep learning. Uh, so DDL provides uh, C and Python libraries uh, that provide uh, communication functions. Basically, uh, it gives you uh, all reduce broadcast you know, scattering together, uh, and uses MPI and Nickel underneath. Uh, it also provides framework integrations, uh, you know, mainly with CAFE, PyTorch, uh, TensorFlow, uh, 
uh, making it easy for the user to you know, modify their, their training script to be distributed. And it also provides a tool for launching these distributed jobs. Uh, we call it DDL Run. Uh, that does a, a lot of work for you. Uh, does some troubleshooting across a cluster uh, and, and some initial setup. Uh, so what DDL actually does, uh, or it's all reduced does, is it, uh, it uses knowledge about the, the topology of the cluster to optimize its all reduce. Uh, so it tries to do, so DDL really shines when you have a, a hierarchy of communication bandwidths. Uh, and for example, uh, in a power box, you, you even have very fine grain hierarchy. Uh, so usually you have, uh, you have within a box, GPUs can talk to each other really fast. Uh, if two nodes are in the same rack, they can talk to each other a little slower. Uh, and then you may have you know, a layer outside of racks. Say you have two racks that, that go through another switch. Uh, there's another hierarchy of communication. Uh, in a power box, you have a smaller or a lower level hierarchy where uh, GPUs are actually on different sockets. Uh, so in the summit boxes, you have three GPUs on one socket, three GPUs on the other socket. So you actually have a hierarchy of communication there as well. Uh, and so what, what DDL tries to do is line up uh, all of your, your communications so that you never have a fast uh, communication band or fast uh, link waiting on a slow link. Uh, it, it, line, it schedules them so that you always have fast, uh, or you know, that you have the same speed communications happening together. So you really see DDL work well in, in non-flat topologies. Uh, but we see really, so far we've seen really good scaling results uh, when, when using DDL. All right, uh, so next we're gonna get down into going through some code, uh, a small code example, where we, we look at how to distribute the training of a, a TF Keras model. Uh, so we'll be looking at the, you know, the, the standard example, the MNIST example that comes with, with TensorFlow. Uh, for a, of a TF Keras model. So the main things you need to do to distribute your, your training, uh, you gotta import the libraries. Uh, it's interesting that that's really the only necessary step that you have to do once you've imported DDL, your training is distributed. Uh, it might just be that they're working on the same data, so they're not really learning anything. Uh, if, you've, if you've split your, or if you read your data a certain way, then just importing is all you need to do. Uh, but for most cases, you have to import, you have to split the training data, You've got to tweak your hyperparameters uh, because you've changed your problem some, and add some add some callbacks. Uh, and if if you want to see the original script, I, I link to it in the, the presentation. All right. So again, the, the first step we do is import DDL. Uh, you can see the line there towards the bottom in green. Import DDL. Uh, this script was originally written for just native Keras, so we've actually switched it from native Keras to TF TensorFlow Keras, also. And again, this is the only necessary step. Uh, if we'll see in, uh, on the next slide, if, if you split your data right, or if you had done your data differently, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to do anything else. But uh, the next step is to split the training data. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if your training works by actually iterating through every uh, element in your data set uh, repeatedly, you know, and you call that an epic, uh, then you need to split your data. Uh, that way, each GPU sees a different set of the data. Otherwise, they do the same training, averaging your gradients, would, they'd be averaging the same values. Uh, however, there are a lot of uh, training projects or uh, networks that use, uh, instead of iterating through their data, they actually randomly augment, you know, randomly sample from their data set and augment the data on the fly. Uh, if you're doing something like that, you don't actually have to split the data as long as you have different seeds on each GPU. If you have the same seed, you're back to the same, using the same data on each, on each network. All right, so here we'll see, uh, well, we're splitting the data. Uh, up at the, the top, we actually set, set aside the full test data so that we can come back at the end and do a full validation run. Uh, but you'll see Xtrain and Xtest, we're using NumPy to split those arrays. Uh, and you'll notice we're using two functions, ddl.size, ddl.rank, uh, if you're familiar with uh, using MPI or something like that, uh, ddl.size gives you the number of GPUs in your training job, so that's the number of GPUs, not the number of nodes. Uh, and ddl.rank, yeah, .rank gives you the, the ID of the current uh, 
uh, GPU. So if, you, if you're running on two uh, summit nodes, uh, 12 GPUs, your size would be 12, and your rank would range from 0 to 11. So we use those uh, functions to split up the data. You can also use those functions to control things like printing only on rank 0 and things like that. Uh, and then we, we split up the, the labels as well. All right. Uh, next step is to modify the hyperparameters. Uh, so the only hyperparameter we're going to modify in this case is the learning rate. Uh, a lot of times you'll modify things uh, like batch size. Maybe you'll modify your learning rate decay, uh, things like that. Uh, really, once, you, once you're distributing your program, uh, we'll see towards the end uh, the technical considerations. Uh, you end up with, uh, you know, you're, you're changing what training is actually happening. You really need to go in and tweak your, your hyperparameters. Uh, in this case, we're scaling the learning rate uh, by the number of learners, basically trying to offset the increase in batch size. Uh, since we are distributing, and we'll see in more detail, uh, the batch size ends up being multiplied by the number of learners, or the effective batch size. So we're scaling the learning rate up to kind of to speed up learning, speed up the, off, or the, the update of the, the weights to offset that. All right. Uh, final step is to add uh, these callbacks. So Kiris has this idea of callbacks. Uh, and there, there's two DDL callbacks that we provide to make distributed training easier. Uh, the first one is, we just call it the DDL callback. Uh, that should always be the first callback. And what it actually does is synchronize the metrics across the learners. So Curious has this idea of metrics where you know, it'll, it keeps a running accuracy or a running uh, mean squared error or a running uh, variance, or, you know, w whatever these running metrics. Uh, and what we do is, uh, with this callback is to synchronize those across GPUs so that if you use th those metrics to make decisions, they're the same. Uh, especially things, you know, a lot of times you use an early stop functionality in, in Curious. And if your metrics are different, one may stop and the other might not. So you don't want that. Uh, and the other callback is the global variables callback. Uh, it has to be the last callback in the list. And basically, all it does is uh, synchronize your global variables. So whenever the models are, or are initialized on each GPU, uh, you've got to make sure all of the initial values, initial weights, and things are initialized to the same values. Again, you want to keep your models identical on all the machines. And that, that callback guarantees that. And lastly, you, you can run it. Uh, so those are, those are the only source code changes needed uh, to distribute the, uh, the training of that MNIST model. Uh, and then if you launch it using DDL run, uh, it works. It'll run on any number of nodes that you give it. Uh, so in this case, we go from one node with four GPUs. So these are P9s with, with four GPUs each. Uh, you give it uh, the host name. It does some stuff for you and then runs, gets you something like 1,200 images per second. Uh, you scale that up to a list of 10 nodes, and you get something like 12,000 images per second throughput. All right. So now uh, we've seen a simple example on how to uh, distribute your training. We're going to get into, uh, I, I called them earlier, gotchas. So these technical technical considerations uh, that you run into when distributing your training. The first one being batch size. Uh, and this one, uh, with data parallel distributed deep learning, you're always going to be dealing with this problem with a, a large batch size. Uh, so the idea is that uh, the accuracy of a model is really sensitive to changes in the batch size. I used to think that, you know, barring memory limitations on the GPU or things like that. You should make your batch size as large as possible. Uh, you know, it optimizes your, your computational performance because you have large batches on the GPU doing the work. Uh, but it actually isn't always the case. Uh, the, the picture that we saw earlier with the, the comic where you know, your, your deep learning is just some linear algebra. You throw some data in. You stir stuff around and see what comes out. That, that really tends to be the case. Uh, so just because you think something is going to be better, it's not always the case. You mix stuff around, you get better results. Uh, so this idea that using smaller batch sizes actually improves your convergence is a real thing. Uh, so you run into a problem when you're distributing your deep learning and you have your, your batch size ends up getting multiplied by the number of GPUs. Your, your batches get 
big really quick. Uh, so you have to take that into account. Uh, so to kind of to illustrate it and drive it home, the uh, if you have you know in GPUs, uh, as I said before, each one gets its own local batch. They're all different batches. You're, I, I call the effective batch this this group of all these local batches. That ends up being your actual batch size uh, for the you know for each for each iteration. Uh, yeah, hurts your convergence. Uh, so. You can, you can try different things uh, to offset this, this increase in batch size. Uh, you can reduce your local batch size, uh, but that only goes so far. Uh, if, you, if you reduce your local batch size too far, you, you end up suffering performance because you're not fully utilizing the GPU. Uh, you're putting small batches on the GPU and you, you become bottlenecked by going back and forth to the GPU. Uh, so, and, and you can only go down to one, uh, batch per, or one image or one data point per GPU. Uh, so that, that has a, a limitation. Uh, you could also, uh, another thing you can try to do is use other hyperparameters to make up for that increase in batch size. Uh, and the first one being the learning rate. So we saw an example of that in the example. Uh, the first uh, thing that you can try to do is, is scale up your learning rate to make up for that increase in batch size, uh, but that's not, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one trade off. Uh, you, can, you can use a larger learning rate a lot of cases uh, and, and, and offset that, but at some point it, it gives out. You can't you know, multiply your learning rate by thousands and expect it to, to do something meaningful. Uh, so it really comes down to both of these are you know, hyperparameters uh, of the model. Uh, and it really comes down to whenever you scale up your training uh, and distribute it, you really need to go in, you're gonna end up having to retune your hyperparameters. Uh, while, so, so yeah, you have a trade off there. Uh, if, you, if you spend a lot of time tuning those hyperparameters on a, on a single GPU or on a single box, uh, the moment you distribute it, those hyperparameters are gonna mean less. Uh, you'll just have to go in and, and, and fix them, which is, which is bothersome. All right. uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, this distribution method works for most layers. One of the main types of operations that it does not work for is something called batch normalization. Uh, so this is a commonly used uh, neural network layer uh, that has to do with, uh, at that stage, it takes the batch and it, uh, you know, it scales it and shifts it based on the, the, uh, the mean and variance of, of the batch. Uh, so it kind of normalizes your your data, but only on a batch by batch level. Uh, the problem with that is the each model, each GPU is only looking at their local batch. They're not looking at the global batch uh, or the effective batch for the whole iteration. Uh, so it doesn't do the exact same operation as it would uh, on a single GPU. Uh, at least not out of the box. That uh, I have here that the that's alternative one where it looks at you know, each subset of its, its own, uh, or its, its local batch. That's basically the default behavior for most frameworks. Uh, batch normal just work on the, uh, the, the, local, the local batch and, and not worry about the others. Uh, but you, you see, uh, you see uh, an accuracy hit when you do that in most cases. Uh, another option is to actually, uh, or, uh, so if we, if we actually try to synchronize these, uh, these means and variances uh, across the batches, so across the GPUs, so that we do have one global, uh, one global mean and, and variance that we can use to normalize the batch, uh, you, you end up with a, a very large communication overhead. Uh, so for example, on ResNet 50, uh, the image classification model, uh, it's, got, it's got about 50 batch norm layers spread out within the network. Uh, adding a synchronization step that actually synchronized the means and variances on each of those layers ended up multiplying the runtime by three uh, on something like four nodes. So like 16, uh, four nodes with four GPUs each, so like 16 GPUs. It was three times slower to actually keep the batch norm synchronized. So it's just not feasible. Uh, another option, there are other normalization techniques. Uh, there's like a weight normalization. And since the, uh, since the network does see the full uh, 
the all, you know all the weights you know, normalizing in that regard is something that that each uh, GPU can do. All right. Uh, another thing to keep in mind uh, with especially with things like Keras uh, or TF Keras, uh, most frameworks support some kind of on-the-fly validation. Uh, this lets you. While the, the model's training, uh, you do validation along the way uh, with some you know, dev data set, uh, and then you make decisions based on the accuracy of, of, of that dev data set. Uh, so for example, uh, if you, to, to prevent overfitting, Curious has this thing called early stopping, and if, you, if your validation accuracy plateaus at some point, say 200 epics or 100 epics, uh, then, you, then you stop your training there and you, and you finish, you early stop. Uh, the problem is if you don't distribute that validation, then you'll, you'll quickly run into a bottleneck uh, because that, that ends up being the, the piece of work that's not being divided. Uh, so you saw in the example that I showed, we did distribute, we split the, uh, the, the training uh, data, or the, the test data set as well. Uh, but it's important to keep in mind that that may not scale forever because oftentimes your test data set is much smaller than your, your actual uh, training data set. Uh, so it may be that you run out of, of samples to distribute. So it's important to keep, keep that in mind also. Uh, one final uh, kind of technical consideration is uh, if you've set up a data pipelining project, so say you know a lot of projects uh, I mentioned before does, do this thing where you you do some data augmentation on the data set on the fly. So you're, you're pulling your your data, your images from uh, the file. Maybe you crop them, uh, you skew them. Uh, that way, it, you know you're increasing your your effective data set. Uh, you know you feed it through your network and, and you do some stuff with it. Uh, so this pipeline. Uh, you see a lot of cases where they've optimized this pipeline for a single GPU on a single box. Uh, so that augmentation is using the, you know, the full compute or the full CPU power on that box. And the moment they try to distribute, you know, they're not getting uh, full GPU utilization, and, and they don't know why. Uh, well, it ends up those uh, that augmentation, uh, the data augmentation is battling with each other on the CPU, uh, not able to fully utilize the GPUs. Uh, so it, you know, in, in the summit case, you end up with six times the data augmentation uh, working on the same, the same hardware. Uh, so it's just important to keep this, when, when you're designing this pipeline when you're, and going to distribute it, you need to keep in mind uh, that this, this stuff happens. All right, and that's really uh, all I wanted to go over. Uh, the presentation has most of the, the information, the references for the information I use, so if you want to go out and do some investigation yourself uh, or look at the example that I gave there at the bottom. Yeah. That's it. Anybody have any questions? We're a little early, so gain some time. Huh? Hey.